And we'll move on to the last speaker of the morning, uh, who is Olivia Vincelli, whom I know quite well from her work as a researcher at the Maud Abbott Museum. Olivia has studied physical and museum anthropology, with her graduate studies focusing on the history of craniotomy and its racial origins. She subsequently has worked at the American Museum of Natural History and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiners in Forensic Anthropology in New York. And she'll speak to us today about Maud Abbott's interest and work in the history of nursing. We have heard a little bit about this in the previous talk by Emily. I think uh, Olivia is going to expand on this. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone, and hello to those joining us virtually. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my talk will focus on, as Dr. Fraser said, one aspect of Maude Abbott's career, namely her work on Florence Nightingale and her academic relation to nursing. I'm also going to address some of the difficulties encountered by women in the male-dominated field of medicine, as exemplified by Nightingale and Abbott during the last half of the 19th and early 20th centuries um, as extensions to what has already been discussed so far. And since most everyone is now familiar with Abbott's earlier years, I'm going to actually start at the beginning of her work at McGill, which began in 1898 when she was appointed curator of the Medical Museum, which is currently housed in the Strathcona building. And though it wasn't her dream role here, she actually didn't know much about curating, having completed her medical degree at Bishops because McGill was not admitting women. She used it as a foothold because she was very fond of the university. But in order to learn more about how medical museums functioned, she went on a tour in the United States in 1899. And it was during her time in Baltimore that she met William Osler, who played such an important role in her career. Not only was he the one that influenced her to pursue the study of congenital cardiac disease and directed her attention to the Holmes heart, which she herself attributes as the origins of her interest in this field, but he encouraged her to make the best of her work at the museum, and that's exactly what she did and part of the reason we gathered to discuss her legacy. So while her claim to medical fame is in heart disease, for instance, her publication of the Atlas of Congenital Cardiac Disease, she held a, no a number of other academic interests, and it's one of these that I will discuss further. So we're not sure exactly how she became interested in nursing. We do know that she traveled to Harvard in 1915 to do work on congenital heart disease, specifically related to the transposition of the great vessels, an example of which you can see here in one of her specimens. But during this time, she must have met Dr. Harvey Cushing, who was considered a father of neurosurgery, who then invited her to give a presentation on the topic of her choosing to the Harvard Historical Club, which she delivered in December of that year. And for this presentation, she chose to focus on the history of nursing, specifically Florence Nightingale and her reformations of army nursing practices, which she titled Florence Nightingale and Modern Red Cross Organization. And her talk also included a series of images. And it was so well received that she then decided to have it published in book form in 1916. And she had about 1,000 copies printed, and the uh, proceeds of the sales were donated to the Canadian Red Cross. And it's a short book of roughly 80 pages, and it includes the 15 images of Nightingale from childhood to old age that she used in her Harvard presentation. The number of the images she used were acquired from various individuals she, who worked in McGill hospitals, such as a young Nightingale on the left here, which was in the possession of Miss Nora Livingston, who was the lady superintendent of the Montreal General Hospital, and on the right, Nightingale after her return from the war, which she acquired from the Canadian Nurses Association in Montreal. And like the presentation, the book was also a success. Even Osler uh, was impressed with her work and wrote to her in 1917 saying, Dear Miss Abbott, what a delightful bit of work. Wherever did you dig up all that interesting material? Stop pathological work at once and take to your natural vocation bibliobiography. It is a splendid record. And so more than likely on the basis of this work, in 1916, she was invited by the lady superintendent of nursing, Miss Mabel Hersey, 
to give the valedictory address to the graduating nurses student, nursing students at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, and then also to give a series of lectures on the history of nursing beginning the following year. Uh, and she was the first to give this course, and she did so through the 1930s when possible. So in the year leading up to this, she expanded on the 15 images she used in her Harvard talk in the form of lantern slides, which eventually numbered over 200 to satisfy a course of eight lectures. And her lectures were also published in parts um, in the Canadian Nurse Journal. The first was printed in May of 1920. And briefly, lantern slides as a technology actually originated in Europe um, for the purposes in the entertainment industry. However, when the concept came to North America, they held a greater benefits in education. And so Abbott took advantage of this new method for her own classes. And her approach to teaching the topic was not only chronological, but it also funneled down from a broader global and cultural consideration of healing practices to a discussion on Nightingale, her contributions, her successors, as well as notable practitioners during the 18th and 19th centuries. So for instance, the first slide, the first 39 slides were dedicated to what she called primitive nursing and medicine, from medicine in ancient civilizations to nursing in the early Christian church. So here we actually have examples of uh, slide one, a Tibetan amulet used for exercising sickness demons, and slide 39, a fabiola from a group of Roman ladies who devoted themselves to caring for the sick and poor. And from the beginning, Abbott notes that in every cultural group, a basic form of nursing takes place and is done primarily by women. In other words, as far back as she could trace, even in its earliest forms, nursing was placed in the charge of women of faith or a religious order of sorts, stating, an elementary nursing of the sick and wounded takes place to a greater or less extent in every tribe and lies mostly in the hands of its women. So as early cultural perspectives of illness and diseases were often associated with an evil of sorts, a popular method of removal and prevention included the use of talisman or charms. And she then discusses the Greco-Roman medicinal practices and their progression into the early Christian church so here we have Galen, who is considered the greatest of the Roman Greek physicians who came to be known as the father of experimental medicine. And then the secularization of nursing slowly began in the 10th century during medieval nursing, but only became established in the 11th century, particularly with the advent of social service charity organizations, uh, including the founding of the French hospitals in America, an example being the Hotel Dieu in Montreal, which was founded by Jeanne Moss. And moving to the end of the 17th century, Abbott discusses what she called the dark period of nursing and the rise of prison hospital reform because patient care had fallen to the responsibility of the servant class and would remain so for the next century, roughly. And so her method of teaching the course was so popular that she had the slides and lecture notes duplicated for distribution, and they were purchased by training schools across North America. And the notes are quite specific and extremely detailed. She even provided descriptions in, uh, of the slides in an index at the end of each section, as you can see here. And as you read through her lecture notes, you come to the section on Florence Nightingale, which began this part of Abbott's academic journey. And I'd like to spend a minute talking about Nightingale uh, as a preface to some comments about the similarities between the two women. So born in 1820 in Florence, Italy, to a wealthy English family, Nightingale was brought up in England. She was also educated at home, but by her father, where Abbott was taught by her grandmother. And Nightingale began demonstrating a strong sense of caring, particularly for animals as a child, two of the more known tales being that of the injured dog that she nursed back to health and the fallen owl that she rescued at the Parthenon in Athens. And both of these images were part of Abbott's book and course materials for what she, or what they brought to the narrative of her story. She then became interested in nursing humans as an adolescent and subsequently underwent formal training in Germany at the Kaiserwerth Deaconesses Institute and in France at the Sœur de la Providence before the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853. 
and she then traveled to Crimea the following year. And after her arrival, the death toll is reported to have fallen dramatically as she had a huge impact on the care of the wounded. And so her ideas and innovations about patient care would eventually be published in 1860 as her famous notes on nursing. It's structured such that each chapter focuses on a different aspect that she remarked from her experiences as being crucial to patient care, from ventilation and warming to cleanliness of rooms and walls. And when she finally returned to England in 1856, she set to work on the army reforms, most of which had to do with hygiene. She established the sanitary commissions to investigate the conditions in order to make the necessary changes. And most of these changes were details as simple as making sure the bedding and clothing of the soldiers were properly cleaned and ensuring individualized nutrition for each patient, which are aspects that today we consider basic in patient care. Unfortunately, as a result of the energy that she expended and the illnesses that she herself endured during her work, she spent her later years invalided, but persisted in her reforms until her death in 1910. So from 1872 to her passing, she focused primarily on the organization of training schools. For instance, the training school for nurses at St. Thomas Hospital. And it was these nurses that were later dispatched all over the world to introduce the new way of nursing, including the Montreal General Hospital. And though she was instrumental in elevating the standards, at the time of Nightingale's birth, nursing was secularized and had designated practitioners, but it had yet to be formally considered its own profession. And Abbott makes the reader very aware that Nightingale was not responsible for originating the concept of nursing, but she did help to transfer it from the category of the domestic to that of medicine in its own right. And so in addition to homeschooling, there are a number of other parallels between Abbott and Nightingale, the first being that of mentorship. Um, so as we know, Abbott had a very strong working relationship with William Osler, where Nightingale had a similar relationship with Lord Sidney Herbert, who she first met while in Rome as an adolescent and who would end up supporting her in everything she did for nursing, both during and after the war. And as minister at war at the time, he wrote to Nightingale requesting her help and had her sent overseas with all the support she would need. And he even gave her authority over female military nursing establishments in the East. And in the years after the war, he also helped her push her efforts for reformation in military nursing practices. And both of these women were also greatly affected by the deaths of their respective mentors, Osler in 1919 and Herbert in 1861. In fact, Abbott writes in the book on Nightingale that Herbert's death threw her into a state of extreme despondency, for she had lost not only a dear personal friend, but the ally on whom her sanitary form reforms depended. An additional similarity between Abbott and Nightingale were the difficulties that they faced as women in the male-dominated medical profession. So as previously mentioned, Abbott was refused admission to McGill uh, Medical School because she was a woman and was still not allowed to practice medicine even after being hired in pathology in 1898. In fact, she had to rely on male physicians to procure many of the specimens for the museum. And similarly, Nightingale faced difficulties um, in her own right. So for instance, though she was sent to the army hospital with support from Herbert to fix a system that had seemed beyond repair, she had to do it almost covertly to stay within her boundaries as a woman. And she balanced this by doing what was required of her from her male medical officers, but would on occasion pay for her own reserve of supplies to avoid issues where, where possible. However, there were instances where she deliberately took supplies to do what she was sent there to do. So she walked a fine line between doing what she was asked and what was necessary. And so though it would be conjecture to say that either would self-identify as a feminist in the way we know it today, both women were certainly aware of the issues brought up by their gender as indicated by some of their writings, and in retrospect were pioneers in the interests of women. So for example, when asked her views on women's rights, which were slowly gaining momentum, Nightingale says in her notes on nursing, 
I would earnestly ask my sisters to keep clear of the jargon, which urges women to do all that men do, merely because men do it, and without regard to whether this is the best that women can do, and of the jargon which urges women to do nothing that men do, merely because they are women. Surely woman should bring the best she has. In a letter ostensibly written by Abbott around 1930, she states, we have such difficulty, particularly in Canada, being recognized as equal to men. On the university side, openings for women come bit by bit and accompanied by discriminatory restrictions. And as others have mentioned that those who remember Abbott, rem or who, who knew her, remember her for always having several projects in the works, which suited the fact that her interests extended far beyond what she intended to pursue in the realm of medicine. However, a consideration then becomes whether the things that she worked on outside of medicine were the result of having not been completely included, not just in medicine, but at McGill, which was a university that she loved dearly. And so was her willingness to take every project a means to stay relevant or to prove herself because as a woman, she would never truly be viewed as equal to her male colleagues. So that said, while at first it would seem somewhat arbitrary that she would present a talk on Nightingale to the Harvard Historical Club, the way in which Abbott discusses her makes her choice seem far less random. Nightingale and Abbott were both women who succeeded in the medical field in their own respects. In Abbott's words on Nightingale's determination, she actually likened, uh, likened it to the 12 labors of Hercules, saying, had it not been for the absolutely Herculean labors of Florence Nightingale, invalided in body, but of indomitable will, after her return from the Crimea, the terrible lessons of the war would have remained unlearned by the British nation. Moreover, throughout her writings, Abbott takes every opportunity to note the achievements and involvement of women, as well as the things that were taken from them over the centuries and how those exclusions proved detrimental. So that said, one can only imagine that Abbott must have felt the same forces against her. So in summary, Abbott's academic work on the, history, on the history of nursing, though less recognized than her work on congenital heart disease, exemplifies her academic curiosity and ability. And although the origins of her interest in nursing are uncertain, it could be argued that it stemmed at least in part from her real and apparent difficulties as a woman in medicine at McGill. Both Abbott and Nightingale, as professional women in the late 19th and early 20th century, provide and still represent examples of what can be achieved in any adverse sociocultural circumstances. So thank you so much for your time and a special thank you to our organizers and hosts for the event, thank you.